brought to you by Head Start Basketball. You don't see too many youth programs that teach how many high fives are you giving in, in, a, in a structured setting. How many times are you going to say, hey, great job, good shot to your teammate. And it's really all things that we're bringing to our program, and it's why, we're, uh, it's why we started it. We want to make sure that we're building great teammates, great players, great people off the floor, and teaching little things that a lot of programs, I guess, around us aren't teaching, just fundamental stuff. And then most importantly, all the little things that help you make a team for, for the next level, whether it be middle school, high school, or college. Derek Klein is the boys' basketball director for Empire Youth Athletics in New York City. He is also the assistant varsity coach at National Powerhouse Lou High High School in Long Island. Derek played his college basketball at SUNY Brockport for four years and has been in the basketball training business for six he has trained athletes from elementary school all the way up to the professional level. Coach Klein has a master's degree in recreation and sports sciences. After you finish listening to this episode, please leave us a five-star rating and review on your favorite podcast app. Those ratings help others in the basketball community to find our show. Make sure you subscribe to the Hoopheads podcast on iTunes, SoundCloud, Stitcher, Spotify, or Google Play so you never miss an episode. Take some notes as you listen to this episode of the Hoopheads podcast with Coach Derek Klein from Empire Youth Athletics. Hello and welcome to the Hoop Heads Podcast. It's Mike Cleansing here with my co-host Jason Sunkel. And tonight we are pleased to welcome from Empire Youth Athletics, Derek Klein. Derek, welcome to the podcast. Thanks for having me, guys. I appreciate it. Yeah, we're excited to have you on, get a chance to talk to you a little bit about your organization, all the great things you're doing for kids up there in the New York area. Let's start out, though, by going back in time, Derek, and talking about how you got into the game of basketball as a kid, what made you fall in love with it, and why it's something that you've decided to continue to pursue throughout your lifetime. Um, so I, I, it goes way back. So I think I started playing basketball when I was about five years old. Um, I'm the baby of the family. So my older brother, my older cousins, they would uh, take me out in, you know, in front of the house and kind of beat me up a little bit. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, but, you know, at the time, you don't realize why they're doing it. So, you know, a lot of frustrating times growing up. Um, I remember one particular situation. My brother went to Indiana University, and uh, I was very competitive. I was about, I, I want to say, anywhere from 7 to 10 years old. And uh, my dad was still in shape playing. <laughs> Not anymore, but he was still in shape playing. <laughs> so we, we Don't say that about your dad, Derek. <laughs> come on, man. man. Come he, on, we he, just had Father's Day. Don't throw your dad under the bus right away. <laughs> hey, we played some pickleball. He's fine. He's all, all good. All right, nice, nice. That's good. <laughs> um, but I remember we, we, you know, you go up to campus and we went to play a pickup game. And, uh, you know, my brother, his new roommate, and my father stepped on the court as a three-on-three game. And I was begging to get in. I was seven to ten years old. I wanted to compete. Um, so they finally subbed me in. They took the roommate out. So it was me, my brother, and my dad. And uh, they wouldn't give me the ball. <laughs> <laughs> they just would not give me the ball. Obviously, I was a little smaller and probably couldn't play and shouldn't have been on the court. But they let me come on just as a, I guess, as a uh, a token, just to make me feel good. But I ended up crying because they didn't pass me the ball, um, just to show you my competitive nature. Um, so growing up, that's kind of what it was. I was a young guy. I was the baby of the family. Uh, they they didn't take it easy on me, but it really made me uh, enjoy being out there, just because they were my older siblings and cousins to play with them, and I just started loving the game that way. My dad played, uh, you know, almost pretty much three times a week as I, when I was growing up, and he would bring me into the gym. So I just got accustomed to loving the game and just appreciating, you know, watching the ball go through the net and just uh, the camaraderie that basketball brings and, um, you know, stuff of that nature really got my love for the game at an early age, around five to seven years old. And then I actually, you know, I guess I was pretty blessed to be talented when I was younger. I always played up a division or two. So I went to sleepaway camp. I played basketball for, you know, 18 hours a day. Um, I was a young kid on the block, so they would kind of let me just kind of, you know, <laughs> run around and scramble around. But just I always found my way to the basketball court, even though I was supposed to be in probably arts and crafts half the time. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but they would let me go and just play because they knew I had a love for the game. And then, uh, you know, uh, played high school ball. I played freshman, played varsity as a freshman. Um the coach I had in my first high school was a really big uh, mentor in my life and still is today. He kind of, he was the Coach Carter type. He, 
you know, he, he kind of made basketball and life in the same picture. So it, it taught me life lessons right, right off the bat in high school. He was actually the coach for who's the assistant coach for my brother in high school. And I was in middle school. And he would, even though he was coaching my brother, he would still come down and coach me in middle school just because I was pretty talented. And he, he got the head coaching job at the high school. And he almost tried to bring me up as an eighth grader, um, but it wasn't allowed. So ninth grade year, he took me up on varsity. I played for him for three years. He, it was a great experience. He taught me, you know, just the little ins and outs of the game and how it kind of correlated to life decisions. I remember our first loss. My first loss as a high school kid, and I started crying on the bus. Uh, he stopped. He stopped the bus, and he sat next to me, and he said, "You know why? Why are you crying?" I said, "We just lost the game." He goes, "Yeah, but Derek, you know, you're going home to a good family. Um, you know, this isn't the end of the world. You're going to go home. We're going to get a nice dinner. Uh, we got practice tomorrow, and we got another game in, in two days." Um, and ever since then. Uh, I kind of changed my mindset on that. If you lose, it's not the end of the world, that there's, you know, there's more to life and you can you can bounce right back. And the beautiful thing about basketball, as you guys know, uh, if you lose on Monday or if you lose on Friday, you got a game in two days. So you kind of got to, you know, throw it behind you, work on what you what you didn't do well and just capitalize on the next game. Um, so I went from there and then actually he left uh, going into my senior year and I transferred to. Uh, Lehigh, which is a you know a pretty well known high school in the New York State area, I coach for them now. But I transferred in there as my senior year. I played with uh, NBA star Tobias Harris. Uh, my senior year, he was a junior, so that was pretty cool. We won the New York State Federation title for New York. Where's Tobias yes, going? Where's he going? Where, where's he going? Where's he going? Come on, man. Where's the inside scoop? I don't know if where's I'm allowed. To, I don't know if I'm allowed to uh, just <laughs> give out that information. <laughs> no, I don't. I don't know. I talk to him, uh, you know, once or twice a month. He's busy throughout the year. Uh, he's yep. a great dude. He's he's humble. He's he's never not answered me. Even you know, even the game seven through the playoffs, I t- I sent him a good luck text and you know, just thinking they, nothing of it. I don't think he'd answer yeah, back. Philly's got to be kicking themselves. They were they were NBA champions if they won that. That's game. We're, me and my brother were just saying that if if they if if uh, Kawhi doesn't hit that shot, I think Philly wins the whole thing. They very well could have. I mean, I think if you're Philly or Milwaukee, you got to be, you got to be beside yourself with oh, the fact man. that you didn't, you didn't, you didn't beat Toronto because it would have been set up for anybody to be able to beat the shell of that Golden State team that was left. Exactly. How crazy is how, how that turned out? Clay getting hurt, KD getting hurt, and it's wild. There's oh. so much far-reaching impact on just what's going to happen this summer and it's it's amazing it's amazing what how just those injuries and everything has impacted what's you know what's going to happen on the landscape moving forward it's crazy I, i'm still hoping the knicks give clay and kd a max deal and let them red shirt for a year and <laughs> i don't know it'll be interesting i i, I mean i think they i think they'll probably i can see it definitely them doing it with kd i, I think that you know you i don't know what their options are if they don't yeah, and that that injury's tough though. You guys know. That's right. I exactly. I wasn't around for Dominique, but I think they say he's the only one that came back from the Achilles injury, right? Yeah, I mean he's. I I think he came back to at least close. Right. To being what he was before. I mean, you can even see with Bo- Boogie in a smaller scale. I mean, he yeah, just he's. Look right, yeah. He, yeah, he looks very slow footed, not getting up and down as much, not being explosive. Uh, Kobe it's, struggled it, obviously. Yeah, I mean he's a little older, but still, I just man, that's a tough injury to come back from, and tough. you start listen, putting all those millions out there. Whew, that's oh yeah. rough. I know. Well, listen, I just I just called out my dad. He was some player at 58. <laughs> he <laughs> tore his Achilles. He didn't come. He hasn't been back since. So. Oh, see, he had the. I see. I have the other old man injury. I have the torn ACL. So your oh. dad had the torn. It's, it's torn it's ACL one the, that never got fixed. Yeah, by it's the way. one of the. It's one of the two. It's either you, if you're if you're playing old man basketball, you're either going to tear your ACL or you're going to pop your Achilles. One of, one, of the, yeah. one of the two. Listen, one of I the told, two. I told him he would start playing golf, but you know, he wasn't buying it. He wasn't buying it, and then boom, that happened. I said, "I told you, man." And there you go. That's yeah. it. Hey, you spoke the truth. You I spoke know. the truth to him. All right, so I got one family-related question for you. Talk to me. Talk to me a little bit about whether or not, or how you feel like the impact of you being the youngest sibling had on your development. I know you touched on it just a little bit, but I'm always fascinated by sort of that birth order question of, you know, if you're the youngest that you're always, you're always chasing, you're always hustling, you're always getting pushed around. So how do you feel like that impacted you as you were growing up? Do you think that's something that had a profound impact on what you ended up doing in the game and how you ended up having success? Or do you think it was just, eh, you know, it's just the way it was? 
I think it definitely had some type of impact. Like I said, when I was younger, I had two older siblings, uh, uh, no, no, one older older brother and two older cousins, and we were we were pretty much inseparable. All pretty much, you know. There's two of them. One of you know, my brother and myself we were playing basketball every day. We'd go to the park almost every weekend, and um, whether we just played outside the house or went to the park, they wouldn't take it easy on me, which helped me a lot. And it wasn't to a point where it was kind of like they were picking on me. It was kind of like hey, this is what it's going to be. So if you can't take it from us, you know, how are you going to be able to take it from, you know, your opponents in the future? So they really helped me grow. They were tough on me, but also helped me throughout the way. Um, and then, like you said, just kind of watching and trying to be, I guess, trying to be like them. I watched my brother play throughout high school. He was a really good varsity player, and I always wanted to play on that level um, and, you know, be better than that. So I guess from what you're saying, it, what, it, it had a pretty big impact on me trying to like one up them in a sense. You know what I mean? Absolutely. I mean, I think there's no doubt that I, I just don't see how it can't have that effect because yeah. we all know that brothers and sisters are super competitive with, with each other all the time. And if you're always the smaller, younger, less developed child in that relationship, I've got to believe that that has – in effect, I'm sure there are studies out there about yeah, there's got to be for sure you know, athletes that that are you know where the birth order how how it has an impact and and how that ends up playing itself out over the course of people's lives and I'd love to be able to read one of those studies and just see because I I, I really think that younger siblings have a huge advantage in that especially if you have if you're if you have older brothers as I think especially as a as a male yeah. uh, if you have older brothers that are constantly beating on you and pushing you and then like you said just you aspire to be like them because they're right. doing things that you hope to be doing in the future and I think that's something that sometimes we take for granted especially I think in today's world with the way basketball is I know one of the things that I've talked to a few different people about is if you don't have a connection to your, let's say your local high school, because it's not the same way that it was. And I'm a little bit older than you and Jason, but right. you know, back when I was playing, it felt like I knew who the kids that were that I was going to be playing high school basketball with from the time I was in like third or fourth grade. Yep. And I watched the local high school play and I always knew I wanted to be a part of that. And kids today, I think because they're hopping around to schools and they're playing for this program and that program. Yep. And it's not necessarily that same connection. I think, you know, what you were saying is, you know, you aspired to be like your brother. You wanted to do the things that he was doing. And I think sometimes kids today maybe are lacking that they don't see somebody ahead of them. That's doing something that they want to do other than maybe something they see on social media or yeah. something they see, you know, on YouTube or whatever, as opposed to something that they're actually seeing in their physical life that they can aspire to. Yeah. It's, it's one of those things. Like, I, I mean, we say it, you know, to, you know, to my assistant coaches and whoever's, you know, who I'm around, nobody goes to the park anymore. You know what I mean? Yeah, when I was growing absolutely. up, I was in, I was in the park until about eight or nine at night when my mom had to come tell me that dinner was ready. <laughs> uh, but that's how you met people in, in your neighborhood. You knew where they were going to school. You, you pushed each other, you got each other better. And, that's how you competed at a, at a, you know, at a young age and you, you carry it all the way up through high school. But like you said now, I mean, even at the high school I coach at, um, it's a private school. We get kids in and out. Um, so it's, it's tough for the kids to really know who they're going to be playing with at a younger age because kids are bouncing around, like you said. All right. Talk to me about playground basketball and your opinion about how it helped form you into the type of player that you eventually became, because I'm, a huge proponent of the fact that the system that I grew up in, not necessarily that it was better, yeah. but I definitely feel like the system for me, I look at the two systems and again, I don't want to be the old guy, get off my lawn type <laughs> yeah. argument here. But I do think that if I look at the two systems, the one that we have today where mm -hmm. you're playing travel basketball, or you're playing AAU basketball and you're always playing with, Mostly kids your own age, unless you're maybe playing up a yep. you know up a level. You're always playing with an official. You're always playing with a coach. You're always playing with mom and dad in the stands. Yep. Versus the way I grew up, where I was playing either a in my driveway when I was younger yep. against kids from the neighborhood, or as I got older, I was traveling to you know different playgrounds and different gyms all across the city of Cleveland to be able to mm -hmm. find the best games, regardless of the age of the player that I was playing against. 
And I just feel like that had such a huge impact on my yep. development as a player and as a person and just learning how to interact with different kinds of people, yep. different ages. You play against an old guy who's, again, I'm saying an old guy, but at the <laughs> time when you're, when you're 16 and you're playing yep. against someone who's 29 who maybe isn't very good, but that guy can push you around and he kind of knows the tricks of the trade and he's bigger than you. And you've got to learn how to use your body and do different things in order to succeed. And I think that's something that kids miss today. So talk a little bit about your experience and how you feel the two systems compare from your point of view and how you view the basketball world today. Yeah, Mike, I think you hit it on the head and it kind of brought smiles back to, I was just smiling to myself from the park days because those are, those are my glory days. Absolutely. I played, you know, I, listen, huh. I, played four, I played four years in college, you know, I played four years at D3, but nothing compares to those times where uh, summertime in the park, it would, it would be either me and my two cousins or me and my brother, and we would just, we'd walk or ride bikes from the house to the park, you know, not too far away, it's, it was North Wimmer Park, um, so it was, it was a park where you'd get some inner city kids and you'd get some urban kids and suburban kids all in one place and you guys would just ball out, and I think that honestly toughened me up. It made me, you know, pretty much almost half the player that I was because you're going out there, like you said, you're playing against older people that are trying to get W's in the summer. They don't want to sit on the sideline. <laughs> so yep. they're, they're going to give you all they have. And it really just made you kind of build your, your mental toughness because there was no, your parents weren't around. There was no one that was going to really sulk for you and feel bad for you because there was a bunch of grown men or older kids trying to win basketball games and um i think that really got me out of my shell too because you have to really step up you can't really be you know too shy in those type of environments if you want to stay on the court and really make a name for yourself so i remember it was a small north woodmere park and uh i guess it's considered either wood you know north woodmere uh which is in long island i don't know if you guys are familiar <laughs> um but it's you know it's on the border of Queens, so you got you got some really good bowlers that come out of there. And uh, I remember just a few nights at the, the park, it was packed. There would be like the court would almost look like it was Rucker Park because there was you couldn't even stand on the sideline. It was like waiting room only. And I just remember winning about six or seven games in a row in the park, going crazy. That you know these two um, regular looking kids were just coming in and, and going to work. But it really it made me you know just be able to step outside my comfort zone and, and just kind of play basketball and not worry about anything else. There was no uh, AAU stuff where you had four games afterwards. It was you were playing hard for two and a half, three hours, four hours. You're going to get your work in. You're going to play tough. It, 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 no one's giving you any any type of calls, and you're just going to battle through, and there's no room to cry to a ref. Um, and it really helped you become a better player, person, overall. It built mental toughness. It built physical toughness. And uh, it made you really appreciate the game at its purest form. And it's, it's, it's a shame that there's not much park ball going on these days. I find the park ball that is going on is terrible, too. I, honestly, I don't even know if there is, I, I, and I haven't heard if there is. Yeah, there isn't much good quality playground basketball anymore. You can still occasionally find a group of people playing, but you won't find – the level of competition, the level of players, like, like you, said, you were describing. Like, I remember, I remember even traveling, not from just that North Woodmere Park, but there was a park in the other town that was called Grant Park. So if you would, you know, if you went to Grant North Woodmere Park and you won a few games and it wasn't a good run that night, I remember us, my cousin, driving us to about ten or fifteen minutes down the road and getting more competition and playing some tougher competition that night. And you just got, you know, that's that's how you got better and it's how you worked on your game. Yeah, absolutely. Like when I was a kid. There were certain parks, certain gyms that you knew on this particular night, that was when yep. the best games were. So one park, it might be Thursday night. Another yep. park, it might have been Sunday night. Yep. And you would end up traveling around and going and finding those gyms, those courts to be able to play. And then to your point, you'd go there and there might be, you'd be sitting there on the sideline and there'd be 35, 40 guys yep. Yeah. waiting to play and you, you better like be able to st- park. <laughs> yeah absolutely you better be able to stand up for yourself or exactly you know a team's looking around and you know they got four and if you're just sitting there you got to be willing to go over and say hey man you guys need you guys need a fifth and right kids, it, kids it, today it built, your, built your social skills as it well. did for yeah. sure kids today you tell them that you know hey if you lost the game you had to wait five or six games to get back on and play and yeah, they're they're going to play Fortnite, man yeah wow. they, 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 
Exactly. They're going home and play video games. It's they fun. look at you like you have two heads. They're like, yep. what are you talking about? I don't even under, I don't even understand what you even mean. And I, it's a shame. I, I say it a lot on the show and I've said it numerous times. I feel bad for today's kids and not necessarily because the basketball development itself is worse because I'm not sure that it is. I, it's definitely different. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure it's necessarily worse, but what I do think is that, and, and like you said, you smiled when I was talking, I smiled when you were talking, when you <laughs> said that that was some of the best times oh, of yeah. your life. And I, I agree with that a hundred percent. I think back to the times I spent on the playground and the guys that I knew at that time and just the people who were in most cases, because I started kind of playing at my local park probably when I was Oh, I don't know. I was probably 12, 13, 14 yep. years old. Big, big and I was yep. clearly, clearly the youngest player who was able to work their way onto, you know, whatever the main court, so to speak. Yeah, and exactly. in order for that to happen for me, I had to have guys that were willing to, to advocate for this skinny little 13 year old to mm -hmm. get out on the court. And those were the yeah. guys that put their arm around you and said, Hey, you know, I believe in you and you have conversations with them, not just about basketball, but about life and about what you hope to accomplish. And those are memories and things that there's no way that you can get those same experiences out of the basketball system that we have today. You can get other things. You can get things that are probably equally as valuable, but I don't think you can get that anymore. And I, and I miss that. And I feel bad for today's kids that they don't have it. Right. I remember that. I think that's what it used to be in the summer. So now the summer you know, it's a time to work on your game. And I think a lot of people, and listen, I'm in the business, so I do some training myself, but um, a lot of a lot of kids are doing the individual training instead of when I was younger, you know, I maybe did that once, once or twice a week, but the rest of the, the five days I was going to the park and just playing and, and, and getting better that way and learning new moves just from, you know, re, re, read and reacting against the defense. And like you said, some older guys pulling you over to the side and saying, hey, maybe, you know, if the guy steps up, you cross over that way. You know what I mean? Right. So you're not you're not in the gym by yourself. You're kind of just you're expanding your game by working on your game at the same time. Yeah, I agree with you. I think the the skills training piece of it obviously is something that <clears throat> did not exist at all at the time when I was playing. There was no such thing as a skills trainer. There was no right. such thing as, you know, going and working with somebody in an individual workout. My individual workouts were me yeah. or maybe if I found another player that was yeah. as dedicated as I was that wanted to work out with me, then I could, I could get that done. But there was nobody for me to go to other than maybe my dad yeah. asking him a question or having him come out and rebound for me or those kinds of things. So I do think that the one thing that I, uh, from the skill development standpoint, and I've said it before, but I've had this conversation with several other high school basketball coaches that I think players six through 12 on a high school roster today are far more skilled now, I don't know that they can play better. I don't know mm -hmm. that their IQ is higher. Yep. But if you look at their ability to handle the ball, to shoot the ball, compared to, let's say, players 15 or 20 years ago, players 6 through 12 today on a high school bench are way oh, yeah. more skilled than those other yeah. kids. And I think it's because of the system. The they get exposed and, to better yeah. coaching and more yeah. training and all that stuff. And so that's definitely, I think, something that's been a positive. And, again, we can weigh out the two systems, and I think if you – weighed all the pros and cons, they'd probably come out pretty even. But like I said, I, I tend to, I think you always tend to favor the system that you grew up in just because yeah. that's the experience that, yep. that you've had. So for me, I, I, I miss, I miss the playground basketball for sure. Good without man. question. Yeah. I remember it was a summer day and my mom thought I was nuts. I think it was literally a hundred plus degrees. And I went with my friend and she said, where are you going? And I said, we're going to go to the park. We're going to work on our game. She said, are you crazy? <laughs> it was 100 plus degrees. I remember she called, she she didn't really think I was going. We, we ran out of the house with the basketball. And she called me about a half hour later. And she goes, I thought you were kidding. You better get your behind back home. <laughs> <laughs> and again, that's another case where you tell that story to kids today. And a lot of oh, them yeah. you know, are going to look at you like, what are you talking about? Yeah. Like, it's not an air conditioned gym and I'm not exactly. wearing a Under Armour uniform. Uh, it yeah. doesn't make any sense to me. Yeah, that's ex exactly what's going on. All right, so let's go back to your high school days and talk a little bit about your recruitment and how it went for you getting into college. Because I know that's one of the topics out there that for parents that listen to the show or maybe some players that are listening, I think there's a lot of miseducation about what the process is like. So can you describe for people what your process was like 
in terms of being recruited and in terms of where you ultimately made your choice to go to school and what that whole thing looked like just to maybe shed some light for yep. people on what it was like for you to go through that. Yeah. So, uh, we finished up at Lujai, like I told you, uh, my senior year, we ended up winning the nat, uh, not the national, <laughs> the New York state federation championship, which is really cool. Um, and then the, the phone call started coming in. I had a really good year. Uh, my assistant turnover ratio was off the charts. Um, Tobias made me look pretty good. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, my other wing went to Villanova out of uh, out of high school too, so that my job was pretty easy. But um, I started getting some, I think, a few D two looks, and then mostly Division three looks. And uh, it, it's no joke. Even even at the D three level, you're getting calls every day. You're getting calls nonstop from from numerous coaches, and they're trying to sway you to come there and visit there. And you know you'll you'll play this amount of minutes and blah blah blah. Um, so you know uh, I took a few visits. I went to um, Springfield for a visit, went to New Paltz, went to uh, one more school, and then I visited Brockport where I ended up going. And what really uh, led me to go to Brockport was how good the people were. Um, I think that's a little bit of a misconception nowadays. Guys are just trying to go to just the highest level they can go to. And I think they really need to reconsider um, going to places where they can trust their coaches and there's a good culture there, and I think culture is the most important thing. If you're going to on a visit and the kids are kind of bad mouthing the coach, or they're they're doing things that probably aren't uh, something you're accustomed to or want to be accustomed to, then no matter no matter the level, I think you need to trust the people and trust the staff. And that's really what got me. I visited the school. The the coaches picked me up from the airport. He took me and my dad out to uh, a nice diner. Uh, you know, he checked on me throughout the, the, the whole two days in the visit. Um, he really made me feel like a priority. And um, I think the biggest thing for kids when they're trying to select a school is trust and, and culture and uh, not so much the level. You got to go where you, you, you'd fit and um, where you you can see yourself not only as a player, but really dealing with that staff. I think after college is more important than what you're doing in college, if that makes sense. Yeah, because, no, it makes yeah, it makes yeah, a lot of because, sense. I mean, I I I'm getting married in I think 11 days now. <laughs> um, All right, congratulations. I, my, the two college coaches that recruited me are going to be there. Um, and any big life decision that I have, whether it's work related, relationship related, or or basketball related or business related, I call my college head coach. So when somebody's making a college decision, uh, for whoever's listening, uh, that's I think something that you really have to take in consideration. Can you after college, count on your coach for for life advice and he maybe, you know, help you with some type of, you know, life decision or, or job after school, not just basketball related. So uh, that's my, my, my take on, on the college process. Yeah, that goes. There's two things that I pull out of that. One is obviously as if we flip it around, we've kind of been talking about it from a player perspective. But let's flip it around for a second and talk about it from a coaching perspective. Mm -hmm. I think one of the things that. As a coach, there's nothing more satisfying than having a player call you up years later and ask you for that advice or share something with you or invite you to their wedding. Right. Those are the things that, to me, are priceless when it comes to coaching. There's no better feeling than that call. phone call comes in and on the other end of the line, somebody says, hey, coach. And when you hear that, and especially, it's funny now, I'm 49 years old and I haven't coached in high school for 10 or 11 years, but I still have a few guys that I stay in contact with. And obviously now those guys that I coached when I was 25 or 26 years old and they were 17 or 18, they're adults just like I am. Right. And yet inevitably when you have those conversations, they still call you coach and yep. they don't feel comfortable <laughs> calling you anything besides that. Yeah. And that's one of the most gratifying things because you know then that you had an impact. So I, it's great to hear that you were able to develop that type of relationship with your college coach. And that goes – that's t total credit to your college coaches for fostering and building those kinds right. of relationships because we all know that not every single coach say, yeah, that, that, does that. Yep. Yeah. It's, it's, I don't know if it's a rare um, relationship that we have, but it might be. But – even with, with the recruiting process, just make sure that you trust the staff and the culture's there. And, and even if you're not as close as I am with my coach, that you can 
you can use that coach for more than just basketball after like after when the you know after you're done playing college ball. Yeah, for sure. I and I think it. that that's yeah, it, it really is. And I think those coaches that do that and foster those relationships and obviously as a coach or as a player, you're not going to connect with every single person. Right. So it's yep. possible you could end up being at a place where a coach is really good at relationships, but for whatever reason, you and that coach don't click or whatever yeah, it might I've be. Seen, but, yeah, I've seen it. I've seen it personally. Yep. Yep. But for the most part, if you have a coach who invests in relationships, chances are you're going to have a good relationship. And then the second piece of it that you said, which I think is really important, and I think it's something that kids, parents lose sight of, and that is understanding what the level of play is that you want to get to in college. So Head Start Basketball is proud to announce that we will be hosting the very first Prime Skills Camp an affiliate of the Jay Billis Camp that is held annually in Charlotte, North Carolina. The first Prime Skills Camp will take place on the campus of Western Reserve Academy, just outside of Cleveland, Ohio, in partnership with the Jay Billis Skills Camp. The camp will be designed for boys rising to grades 7 through 9 and will take place August 2nd through the 4th. Prime Skills Camps will mirror the Jay Billis Skills Camp in daily programming, teaching, coach to camper ratio, and quality of instruction. Pace and physicality of drills and other programming will be adapted to suit a younger player, but an emphasis on improving your individual skills in the context of a team environment will continue to be the hallmark of Prime Skills Camps. Please visit headstartbasketball.com or jbilliscamp.com for more information or to get registered. People get enamored by the division one and they forget yep. about the fact that there are lots of other opportunities to play college basketball beyond division one. And again, I look back on my own experience and I've told this story before, so I won't go into the whole thing, but basically yeah. for me, I felt like it was very, very important for me to play division one basketball. When I was coming out of high school, I played against a bunch of guys that, uh, here in the Cleveland area that I felt like I was as good as, and I was one of the last people to be able to get an opportunity to get a scholarship and go to school. And I saw all these other guys sign. And I'm like, I'm better than him. I'm right. better than him. Yep. Played against this guy all the time. I can't yep. figure it out. And for me, that became really my driving force. And I ended up at a place where I had coaches that believed in me. They had, I had coaches that their style of play sort of catered to the things that I did well. I fit well into their system. And so it ended up that I made a good decision Right. Not, I think, because I made a good decision-making process to do it, but just it happened to work out for me that I ended up in good a good place, the yeah. right place. And it was almost, I don't want to say accidental, but you know, it, 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 was, it was the one offer that I had in hand when I took it, and it all worked out for the best. But I was blind to some of the other levels of play. I know I had division three coaches that, you know, stayed with me from the time I was a junior and they came to multiple games. And yeah. it was one of those cases where I was polite, I was friendly, but even as I'm in those conversations, I can think back to standing in a locker room after a game with, you know, division three coaches and just thinking in the back of my head, I'm sorry, there's, there's no way I'm going to this yeah. school, even yeah. though I like you as a person. And so I was so blinded by just, those lights of, Hey, I want to play division one basketball. And for me, like I said, it just happened that I got lucky and ended up in the right place and it worked out for me, but it could have gone the other way for sure. Right. And yeah, so they're, they're, I think, I think, ahead, and, I think for parents, I think for parents and players out there, it's important. I think you made a great point of, you got to find the right fit. You got to find the right culture. You've got to understand what you're getting yourself into. Go ahead. Uh, yeah, you just, it just reminded me of two things. It, it loyalty is a big one too. You said a lot of coaches were coming to watch you play. I think it was even division three coaches would come watch you play. You, you got to make sure that even though, you know, if there's a team that's been on you since day one, and I see it all the time with our high school guys. Now, um, there's a team that's usually on them since day one and they're playing good. They're playing well, they're playing well. And then all of a sudden maybe a higher level team will just come in and shoot them a text. And then their whole mindset will just, will just change. Um, and you got to be careful with that. Like you said, the level um, may be tricky, but you want to go somewhere where you're wanted. You're not, you're not, you want to be, you want to feel like you're needed and not just kind of like a number that they're going to fill in. And you, you got to make sure that the team that you're going to and the college that you're going to is, is a place where they, they really, really want and need you. 
Yeah, I would agree. I would agree 100% with that. And it's easy to get caught up. It's yep. easy to get oh, caught yeah. up in. Yep. I get, I got this letter. I got this one phone call. Somebody told me that this person said that that person was watching me or was going to come to the game. And those are all things that, again, it's great. And as a 16 or 17 year old kid to hear those things, we all get flattered by them. It's just important that you have people around you and as parents or as coaches, whether that's the AAU coach, whether that's the high school coach, that somebody is looking out for the best interest of that 16 or 17 year old who yep. may not always understand all of the situation and all the possibilities right. that are out there in front of them. Which is tough in the business too, because it is a business, the college world. Um, for sure. Unfortunately, so you just got to make sure that, um, you know, this, and this is advice for, for kids that are getting recruited to make sure that the, you're, you're going to be around good people. Um, and that, like I said before, you got to be able to trust them and make sure that they're going to do right by you in whatever situation may arise at, at the university or college. Absolutely agree. All right, let's shift gears to you and coaching and talk a little bit about when you first started to think about maybe wanting to pursue coaching as a profession, as something that you were going to do for the remainder of your life. Was it something that you always knew from the time you were young as a player? You're like, man, when I'm done playing, I'd like to get into coaching. Or was it something that happened later in life? How, explain to us how you got to the point where you said, hey, I want to stay involved in the game by becoming a coach. Uh, I knew basketball was my passion for, as you know, you can, my mom will tell you when I was younger, I think in fifth grade, I, I wrote that uh, when I grow up, I wanted to, to pretty much live in Madison Square Garden and just, <laughs> <laughs> I think my, my exact words were live in Madison Square Garden and the world was basketball uh, crazy or something. I think that those were the exact words when I was in fifth grade. Can you help have, fix out at all now? Can you say that again? Can you take over for James Dolan? Can you move into the garden and take over for Dolan? <laughs> they need somebody other than that guy, man. I think anyone could do a better job. Us three will go in there and turn yeah. that place up, man. I, th I uh, think you're. I think you're right. He he's struggling. We got to get him out of there, and then hopefully we'll turn. <laughs> we got we got the Nick curse right now, though. We we're gonna get KD. Then that happened, and I know it's crazy. We, we can't figure it out. Hopefully we get it right Thursday night. We'll see. Yeah, we'll see. Who do you want him to take? Um, I kind of like the guy John Moran. I really do. Okay. I like All John. Right. I'm watching TV right now. They're thinking again. The guy Darius Garland and then uh, R.J. Barrett was in the paper today. So yeah. well, there was a, there was some trade rumors going around today too. Yep, I'm watching that. Yeah, I'm so I'm, they, I'm watching the TV trade now. Trade to the Cavs and the Hawks, and there's like a three team trade possibilities. Who Listen, knows? no, no one the Knicks were gonna mess it up. So I'm just yeah, you're gonna, it. right. <laughs> you're like whoever the Knicks pick. We know that's the wrong guy, right? Exactly. So I know. We'll see, that's the guy that's do, not gonna work out. <laughs> whatever we do, it's gonna be the wrong decision. So. <laughs> I'm really, I'm well prepared for that. Understood. Uh, but back to back to your point. So I knew that basketball was my passion. I wanted to play as long as I could. Uh, I think it really turned from me being a player into a trainer coach towards the end of my I think going into or finishing up my senior year. Um, I had a pretty solid career. I ended up fourth time all in assist for SUNY Brockport. Led the conference in assist a few times, but I realized that. As I started getting older and more mature, I started hanging out with the coaches more than the players. Um, and I couldn't, um, you know, I couldn't sit down during the games and I, I wanted to coach every single possession. And when I was in the film room with the coaches while the other kids were messing around and uh, if we had strategy, I was in the, in, in the office with my coaches. When I was in between classes, I went to the coach's office and talked game plan and picked his brain. And I think since then, um, I knew that I wanted to kind of stop playing, but stay around the game and play, you know, you know, in the adult leagues, but coach and train for a living. Um, and, uh, you know, it really be came to realization after I graduated and uh, I went right into, you know, doing youth basketball training and coached, you know, third and fourth graders right out of college. And then I got a volunteer assistant varsity job right out of college and it kind of spiraled through there. And I, I just knew that I wanted to be involved with basketball. And I knew that once college was over playing, I made a decision that I wasn't going to try to make that move overseas. I was going to turn it into play for fun and then coach and train for a living and be around the game that way and impact, you know, the youth and high school kids um, in that regard. What did you love about coaching right from the get go? What was it about coaching? Obviously basketball in and of itself is 
the key driver. It's the driver for what Jason and I are doing here with the podcast right. and you know, when we were coaching and all that stuff, but specifically when it comes to coaching, what about the process of coaching I've, was it that you loved or that you continue to love? I've had, like I told you, the first high school coach I had, the Coach Carter type guy, really helped me out with that coaching wasn't just X and O stuff. It was more helping build young men, uh, which really uh, I took um, I took to heart, and I really wanted to do that when I grew up, too. He, like I told you, he's my mentor. So when he did that when I was younger, it really stuck with me on how he really helped me, not only basketball-wise, but psychologically. Like, after that loss, when I cried on the bus, he made me realize that there's more to life than just hoops. So I, when I coach, I do the same thing now. There's, I try to, you know, kind of, it's basketball and there's life. They're, they're, they're one and the same. So I try to teach life lessons through coaching, which really helps me, um, which really, you know, interests me about the coaching world. And then I, I, I've been told that I'm just kind of blessed that I can impact people in a positive way and I give off a positive vibe. Um, and I can use my positiveness and my motivational tactics and my, I guess, the skills that I have through, you know, being like a people person that can use that through coaching basketball and help people grow on and off the floor is, is uh, really, it's fun for me. It really is. So what are some ways, let's first attack it from your position as a high school coach, and then we'll transition over to Empire. As a high school coach, what are some ways that you incorporate life lessons into what you do with your players on a daily basis? How do you use the game to impact them more than just on the on the basketball floor? What are some specific ways that you do that? Uh, I'm in the building with the kids all day because I'm also a phys ed teacher in the school. So I'm around the kids. They come to my office nonstop. <laughs> um, but I think it's just little things that I that I teach them that I, sometimes I don't even talk about basketball when, when they come to see me. You know, we, we if we had a game or the night before, uh, I'll say a quick few words about the game. But I let them know that, listen, it's it, there's more – than just the basketball aspect. You, have, you need to be a good person. You need to be on time in your classes. You need to treat people the right way. You need to be respectful. Um, you, you need to you know, make sure you're not cursing in the hallway. It, it, it goes hand in hand. And I think the way that I, it, it's also the same thing. If we have practice, I, I, I'll go over to the kids during practice and I won't even talk about the, get, the, you know, I won't even talk about practice. I'll say, how'd your day go? How's your family going? Um, you know, did you did you eat today? Are you, are you making sure that you're staying in touch with your your parents? Are you are you doing your work? So I think those little things um, that are all really all about life um, can also be learned, I guess, just through playing. Because if we it just so happens if we did, you know, maybe beat a team by whatever amount of points the night before, um, I'll always say, hey, listen, what can we do better? Did you, you know, did you? Uh, were you leading the right way? Even though we won, did you did you did you cheer your teammates on as much as you could? Did you push your guys to be the best they can be? So like little things like that for me, I feel I feel like helped them not only grow as players, but once they hear from me that, um, you know, doing more than just winning games, you know, uh, can correlate to like life stuff. And that's relationships. I mean, that what you're describing right there is how do you build a relationship with a kid, or how do you build a relationship with any person? You invest in them. You ask them questions. You try to find out more about them, their life situation, what makes them tick. And I think that's something that coaches today are much better at in general yeah. than coaches 20, 25 years ago, where when I was a kid, the the model coach was the Bob Knight style of coaching, mm -hmm. where you were a brilliant X and O tactician, but you're on the scale of zero to a hundred where relationships were important, you were much closer to zero than <laughs> yep. you were to a well, hundred. I had a coach, my, you know, the, so I transferred into Lujai, which is where I'm, where I finished up my career. Our coach was, was pretty tough nosed. He was, um, I, he wasn't as bad as Bobby Knight, but he wasn't, he wasn't as, um, life coach as the first coach I had. So he was more X and O basketball, his way or the highway. Um, there were no chairs being thrown onto the floor. He did not do that, but I do remember he was going to fight the wrestling coach one day for for. <laughs> <laughs> this is a good for some story. gym we were, time, fighting over gym time. Exactly, we were That's we funny. you know so high schools have the dividers. We yeah. were practicing on the middle court, and the wrestling kids were doing sprints, and they kept hitting the dividers. Um, so he walked over, 
and he said his two piece and he walked back and then all of a sudden all we saw was the the wrestling coach and barged over to the middle court <laughs> um so that's, that's just that's that. and he's and listen he's a, he was a 75 year old man and the coach that's the funny. wrestling coach is a younger guy so it goes to show you who he was but yeah, he absolutely. um but even through even though he was a tough nosed dude i remember he would still call kids into his office and just make sure that they were okay uh, we had some kids that were from overseas. He would make sure that they had lunch money. Um, he'd make sure that their classes were going well. So I really, I was blessed. And then my college coach was great, obviously. I still talk to him. I think that's also what really impacted me to become a coach because the way that those three guys impacted my life through coaching made me want to do the same thing growing up. Yeah, when you have good role models, I think that makes a big difference. And and I think the world of coaching has changed. And, it, you know, you can you can put that, you could put that cause on lots of different things, whether it's the way that we as parents raise kids today, whether it's just the knowledge that it's better to coach out of love as opposed to coach out of fear or hate. And we've just come to know more about how to go about doing that. And so by building relationships, I think that ultimately it's been proven. I know there's scientific studies out there that you can get better performance from someone when you've built a relationship oh, yeah. the with trust them. Then, is there. Yep, yeah. and then you can push them harder because they know deep down that you have their best interest at heart as opposed to that old school, co- school coach who might motivate by fear of mm-hmm. reprisal or punishment or whatever it might have been, might have been. And so I think that there's a shift in that coaching landscape and I think it's a shift obviously for the better. And yeah, so I want to sure. I want to circle back to what you talked about in terms of building those relationships, and you mentioned that as a fit, phys ed teacher who's in the building every day, and the kids stop by to see you, and they plunk down in your office, and maybe they eat lunch or they just come by to say mm-hmm. hello. One of the things that I'm always a huge proponent of, and it's something that is probably has gone down steadily over the years, is the number of coaches who are no longer teaching in the building where they coach and to me when I was coaching high school and I was an assistant varsity coach for I think 13 years maybe 14 years and I was teaching at the elementary school and coaching at the high school Mm -hmm. and in my school district those two buildings are separated by a parking lot okay and so I was right there um, but not in the building where the players that I coached Mm were and even being that close where literally my school day would end and I could take a 30 second walk across the parking lot and be in the building ready for practice yeah, it's huge. and be on time. All that stuff was great, but I still felt that there was a disconnect between me and those players. If something came up during the day, like a change in practice mm-hmm. time or something that, you know, the bus was going to be 15 minutes late, like I would be the last person in the whole group to find out. Yeah. And I didn't see those kids every day. They didn't walk by me in the hallway and give me a fist bump or a high five or just say, Hey coach, how's it going? Or I couldn't ask them about, Hey, how'd you do on that test? Or those things I wasn't able to do. And I felt like that was a disadvantage to me building the kinds of relationships that you were talking about. It was something that I had to work hard to be able to overcome because I didn't have that daily contact. And I think it's one of the things that I really wish that we could have, and I know it's a lot of cases, it's just not possible because of various situations and who's can coach and, and all that. But I think you're much better off if you have a coach who's in the building mm-hmm. than you are with a coach who's out of the building. Yeah, I agree. I think my first two years on the staff, um, I was actually commuting from, from Brooklyn, which is about an hour away. So I'd honestly, I used to miss the first about 10 to 15 minutes of practice and then come in and it, listen, like you said, I felt like I was way out of sync from coming in so late. Um, and it wasn't so late, but I wasn't with them all day. Then I was late at practice. And then sometimes I'd have to jet back home or, you know, leave practice right when practice ended. So I couldn't build those relationships as much as I could. Um, and it was really, I was in a tough spot. And now that I'm in the building the last two years, it's a, I can, it's a totally different, you know, totally different vibe from me and the players. They, they come to me with, life advice, school advice, um, family advice, basketball advice. And I think it correlates to them um, just kind of performing. And I'm, not, I'm, the, I'm the assistant, but I think that 
I'm in the building so that it helps them. They, the trust is there. So they want to do really well on the court for me just because they're with me all the time. Is that, if that makes sense, you know what I'm saying? Oh, it makes total sense. They don't want to let, they don't want to let you down because you're with them all the time. You give them the advice. You, I, I put the extra reps with them on their off periods. We'll put up shots on the shooting gun, whatever it may be. Um, so the relationship is built. And then in the games, they, they go a little harder <laughs> just because they don't want to let you down, which is pretty cool. Yeah, I think that's 100% right. I think when you have that relationship and no matter how you build it and, you know, there's obviously lots of different ways to go about building relationships. But I think just by virtue of spending time with people, you tend to develop relationships. And by you being in that building, that allows you to spend more time mm -hmm. with your players. And you may spend it in different ways. You may spend it just talking to them briefly in the hallway while you're standing outside your yep. door in between classes. It may be a kid comes in and sits down with you and eats lunch. It may be that yep. you go in and you work on your shot with somebody, you know, we work on their shot with them for 15 minutes or a half hour during their free period. And all those different ways all come back to that one word, which is relationships. And when you have good relationships that enables you to be, I think a better coach and ultimately leads back to what we talked about before, which is those phone calls 10 years later after those kids have graduated and they're long yeah. gone and now they're calling you up and maybe still asking you for advice or maybe just sharing something great that's happened in their life. Yep. And there's nothing, yeah. there's nothing that tops that. No, it's, it's, it's still happening now. I mean, we have our kid, uh, we had two kids go to that NBA uh, top 100 camp for high school kids and both kids, you know, simultaneously were texting me, hey, coach, I'm killing it out here. And uh, it was, it's cool. It's like you said, the cool feeling. And then one of our other kids is going back to Puerto Rico to play on the, you know, he got moved up to play on the U19 national team. And nice. you know, he texted me, coach, I'm, I'm flying back to Puerto Rico now. I'm going to do all the things you told me to do to lock in and appreciate the moment. So it's cool to get those texts and um, really know that you're, uh, and I don't, I don't do it for, to get those things, obviously, as you know, but it's cool that this, the work that you put in, uh, and it's a lot of time. You could ask my fiance. <laughs> um, yeah, no doubt. Basketball, basketball is 12 months. She thought it was only five months. It's 12 it months. Better not, it better not be happening in 11 days, man. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, I'm doing, I'm doing Take a day rest. off. Take a day I off know. for the wedding at least, Derek. Uh, yeah, I'm going to try to. She'll kill me if I have my phone out. Um, <laughs> but it, it's cool. And then it, just, just to go back to how, it, you know, how life in basketball and how I, how I uh, you know, keep the two in, in, in the same – uh, I think the main thing that I do and that what our staff does at the school that I'm, that I'm at and then even through Empire, what we're doing with our youth kids is, uh, and I think it's the most important thing, is uh, battling through adversity. Because at some point or another in your life, you're going to hit some type of adversity, whether it's on a minimal scale where you're, you, you know, you, 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 you tripped over something in, in front of all your you know, high school crushes or you, you lose a state championship game like we did. Uh, on a on a clerical error, um, you have to find ways to to battle through and try to take the adversity as a positive on, on on in a way that you can better yourself or better the people around you. So I think that's the most important thing that I take pride in, and then what our staff does, um, we just try to tell our kids that there's there's always something positive from uh, a negative light. All right, I can't let the clerical error pass. Yeah, I knew that was going to come back. I didn't tell you that one in, in Chicago, huh? No, I didn't hear that one. So, Cher, give us the give us the Cliff Notes version of it. Uh, state championship game last year. Uh, we we had you know, it was probably one of our most talented teams ever. Uh, we actually went down to Montverde and competed with them in the beach ball classic. But so we go up to the state championship. We're down the whole game. We come back in the fourth quarter. We take the lead. Um, it's you know it, it's. We take the lead. They come down. They hit a shot. There's eight seconds left. We call our final timeout. Um, their coach is going crazy. The refs like, what's kind of what you know, what's going on? Uh, their coach is screaming, "Hey, they don't have any more timeouts." So he checks the book. The book says that we have no to no more timeouts. Um, if you, if our staff has about seven guys on it. <laughs> <laughs> and two of six them, of them are, six of them are keeping track of timeouts, two, right? Two or three of them are keeping timeouts. Literally the possession before our guys, he had, the coach asked us, "Hey, we have one more timeout, right?" And we said, "Yep, right here." Both guys had it. We checked it. Our book had that we had one timeout. Um, the the official book somehow said that we didn't have any timeouts left. 
So eight seconds left, tie game, state semifinal. Um, we get teed up. Ugh. We uh, the the other team hits two free throws. They pass the ball back in. We got a foul again. They hit another two free throws. We lose the game by four. We shake hands. We go back to the hotel room. Uh, all the coaches in the room. We what we put the film in. We counted uh, that our last timeout would have been our fifth and final timeout. We watched the video. I'm not even kidding. About six times. Uh, we counted that 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 last timeout with eight seconds left was our fifth timeout. So we go back the following morning. Uh, we let the state federation know that we're going to protest the game. Um, we go to the book. We go right to the guy who did our book. He showed us the book. Uh, we had the film on hand. He shows us the time that he thought we took our first time out. He mistakenly put our first time out. Um, it was really the other team who took the time out. And he admitted to messing up. Uh, the other team wow. took a time out with about 535 left in the first quarter. We didn't take the timeout. The other team did. He marked it down as a Lou High timeout, and that's how we lost the game. Well, so he, he admitted to, you know, we, we, we checked it too. So he said 535 on the clock. You guys called your timeout. We put up the film, and on the film it said 535, and it announced the other team took the timeout. He just happened to do a clerical error in the book. And uh, the state told us that we couldn't, you know, um, we couldn't we protest the game. It. Yeah, and we couldn't uh -huh. do anything about it. So we did, you know, it was, it was a really bad situation. We had really six really good seniors last year who deserved to win it. Uh, it was really hard, but it was one of those moments where we had to put away the fact that we were really um, pissed off and, you know, we, we, want, we wanted to do a lot more things than we could have, but we told our kids, like, this is part of life. You, 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 sometimes you battle through adversity, and sometimes even with the law, you're, you're doing the right thing, and they just kind of, you know, um, tell you you're not doing the right thing and you just got to keep pushing forward. And I think that's why this year when we won the state championship, it was so special. I will tell you that that's happened to me twice in rec league games. <laughs> I don't expect it to happen in New York state games. I had a game last year that would happen in our, our silly rec league that I play in. Yeah. Uh, and I, I about flipped my lid because I knew we didn't call a timeout. So you, and this, the worst part is you only get three right. in this rec league and, they, get, they accused us of using all our timeouts, and we got teed up. But yeah. obviously, it's very different. Uh, yeah, this than was, yeah, New this York. was, uh, this wasn't this was easy. To, this wasn't easy to swallow for sure. We were, uh, I think, for the whole summer last year. This, it was a tough, tough, uh, tough pill to swallow. We, we put, you know, as you know, we put a lot of work in, uh, and they, for the guy to admit that he was wrong, and we, you know, we showed that he was wrong, and he admitted it, and he really couldn't do anything, really hurt our guys because we had six really good seniors. Who uh, one kid was from overseas and he left his family at 14, and for him to go out that way was really tough. But um, you know, we won it this year, which was great. It's just last year was was a tough one. I'm sure, yeah, that it was all over the news. Our our, co our head coaches on the radio, it was all over the place. Nobody wants to seek out adversity, but talk about adversity finding you and mm, there it is being a you know being an opportunity to to look at it and that's something that. You're never going to get over. Maybe no, your kids yeah, even, on that team are never going to yeah. get over it. Nope. You're personally never going to get over it, and you're going to be, you know, 95 years old yep. and still talking about it. There are still three more sessions of Head Start Basketball Camp this summer. July 8th through the 12th, we'll be in Strongsville and Avon Lake, and then we'll wrap up our summer of 2019 at the Brunswick Recreation Center from July 29th through August 2nd. Don't forget about the Prime Skills Camp, an affiliate of the Jay Billis Skills Camp that we'll be hosting on the campus of Western Reserve Academy, just outside of Cleveland, Ohio, from August 2nd to the 4th. Check out our website, www.headstartbasketball.com, for more information and get registered today. Uh, you know, I have a feeling that most of the people that I talk to who are super competitive and I'll throw this question at you, do you love to win more or do you hate to lose more? Uh, it's a tough one. Um, I, I think we, I think I personally, I hate to lose, but I, it's, it, it's one and the same. I hate to lose, but winning is freaking awesome. Yeah, I agree. But I hate, but I hate to lose. And the, I hate the to reason lose. why, yeah. Listen, the, reason why yeah. the reason why I say that for me is if I think back to, and I, and to be honest, I think about this more from a player perspective than mm -hmm. a coach perspective. And like you, as a high school coach, I was an assistant coach. So I think as an assistant coach, 
your name is not attached to the record. Right. So coaching takes on, I think it's a little different when you're the head coach versus yep. you're the assistant coach because mm -hmm. the record is attached to the head coach. It's not necessarily attached to the assistant coach. So I look at this question from a, from a playing perspective and the games that I remember, I don't remember very many of the wins. I remember one or two of them, mm -hmm. but the, every loss that I have that was meaningful, I remember those. I remember them in detail. I remember what happened. I remember why it happened. And those are the ones that stick with me. And, and I'll, you know, I'll never, I'll never forget some of them. And I just, I, I can't stand losing. And yeah, I think consequently, you know, I mean, obviously you love to win, but for me, the losses stick mm -hmm. so much that, I, you know, I, I think I, I think I'd have to describe myself as, as hating to lose. Yeah. I think as a player, I think the better mentality might be to go out and hate to lose too, just so you're not putting uh, too much an emphasis on winning, you know what I mean? And not putting too much pressure on yourself. But if you're, right. you're going out there and you're like, there's no way I'm losing, maybe you just kind of leave it on the line and play as hard as you can, and then the results fall how they should, you know what I mean? For sure, absolutely. All right, let's transition from high school to what you're doing with Empire Youth Athletics. Yep. Talk a little bit about the genesis of how it got started, what the vision was that you had when you started putting together – the organization, what you guys are doing now, and just kind of talk to us a little bit about what it's all about. Yeah, so we, we started Empire, I think, about maybe seven or eight months ago, and our our main reason for starting it was because we felt there was a need for um, our type of culture as I'm, I'm a high school coach. My One of my partners is a high school po coach, and then our other partner also helps out with our boys program, and we want to we wanted to kind of translate our high school culture of building, you know, great teammates and great people and, um, you know, the winds will follow and a good culture. We wanted to bring that to the travel AAU world and a travel youth sports program world, which I think is lacking. And I thought we, we thought it was lacking. You don't see too many youth programs that teach um, how many high fives are you giving in, in, a, in a structured setting. Um, how many times are you going to say, hey, great job, good shot to your teammate? And it's really all things that we're bringing to our program, and it's why, we're, uh, it's why we started it. We want to make sure that we're building great teammates, great players, great people off the floor, um, and teaching little things that a lot of programs, I guess, around us aren't teaching, um, which is fundamental stuff. And then most importantly, um, all the little things that help you make a team for, for the next level, whether it be middle school, high school, or college, for our, for our sake. Um, so it's kind of why we started it. We want to, we're, we're trying to build the brand that it's just, it's bigger than basketball type thing. Um, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, or if you've heard this from other AU programs, but there's just not many youth basketball programs that are teaching the little things, um, that help you make a team other than just scoring 30 or night. Um, and it's kind of why we started the program where we rerun clinics weekly. We do. Um, skills training where we run free clinics and every time we go to these gyms or we do it in our gym we're just we're asking the kids to give as many high fives as they can uh, and we ask for three different things we ask that they get better or try to get themselves better we ask that they have fun and then we ask that they try to lift somebody else up during that hour and a half session um, and I don't know how many other programs are promoting that but that's kind of what our mission is it's trying to try to build yourself will build other people up with you as you go along the process and as you play on these teams. Yeah, um, I think, go ahead. I think using that character and leadership piece to differentiate yourself from other programs that are out there, I think that's something that, A, obviously we know long-term and short-term that it's beneficial for the kids who are involved. I don't think there's any doubt about that. Number two, I think that parents, a lot of times, just like we talked about earlier in terms of parental education, mm -hmm. parents need to begin to understand what the value is of those things that you just described. And I'm not sure they always do. I think a mm -hmm. lot of times yep. parents still today look for that shiny one loss record mm -hmm. from the AAU program or the club that they're with. I think that's slowly starting to change. And I think as programs like yours that emphasize some of these other things besides just winning, 
that as parents see more of those programs and they see the results that they get. And when I describe results, I'm not describing the one loss record, but when they see the results in terms of the satisfaction that the kids have of being part of the program yep. and the fun they have. And I, and I like that your very first pillar that you said was to have fun. Cause a lot of times we lose sight of the fact that, yeah. especially when we think about, you know, I'm in the basketball business, you're in the basketball business. And sometimes we forget that, Sure, for us, basketball is a business. But for a kid, basketball should be fun. Yeah, that's if it's not fun, why would they want to play? Exactly, and that's kind of what we say each each and every clinic that we have. If if you're stressing yourself out when you're in the gym, you're you're almost being detrimental to yourself trying to improve your game or or try to get better. If you you need to have fun and almost think of um, think of bettering your teammate first. Uh, in some situations, and then in in turn, yourself will get better without even knowing it. Yeah, I agree 100%. I, I've had this is my this is my second week of summer camp that yeah. I do here, and one of the things that I like to share with the kids on the very first day of camp is very similar to what you said. And my three things are: one, I want you to have fun; mm-hmm. two, I want you to learn something about the game of basketball; mm-hmm. and three, I want whatever we do here, whether it's a camp, whether it's training, whether it's whatever we do basketball wise, I want that camp clinic training to inspire you to want to play more basketball, whether that's just, you go out on your, whether you just go out on your driveway and you're more likely to pick up a ball because you came to one of our camps. Great. If it inspires you to want to try out for your school team. Great. If it inspires you to go from being a starter to being somebody who's an all state player because you participated in something that we did. Great. But I think if we can accomplish those three things, we've done something and and we've made a difference for kids using the game of basketball to do that. And I think from what you've talked about and from what I know about you and the time that we spent together talking in Chicago and then from what we've talked about tonight, that's the same mission that you guys have just maybe phrased slightly differently. But the idea is we're trying to impact kids using the game of basketball and making sure that it's fun because ultimately it's a game. Yeah, that's, it's, it's, that's really what we're trying to do. We're trying to make sure that, we can build them into just coachable, young, you know, hardworking individuals that whether it's through basketball or, you know, in life that they're, they're being coachable, whether it's and we even we have third or fourth or fifth graders. We'll tell them, hey, listen, um, you know, if your boss needs you to do something, don't, you know, you, you do it to the best of your ability and you, you try your hardest and you're, you're coachable to your boss. If your parent tells you, hey, listen, go clean the room or take out the garbage, be coachable bring the garbage out and then, you know, you, you do what you got to do. <laughs> um, Absolutely. It's, it's, yeah. It's all about, we're just trying to teach them, be coachable, work hard, um, be open for criticism, bring a lot of energy, have fun. And, and all the results will follow after that. What's been your biggest challenge in getting empire off the ground? What, what have you, what was maybe surprising to you in starting it? Just what, what were some of the challenges that you faced as you've tried to put together the organization and get it to the point where you're happy with where you're at and what you're doing? Uh, I think we were off to a quick start. I think we got off to a quick start just because we had some pretty cool names behind the business. Uh, I'm coaching at a really prestigious program and uh, my other partners, the girls coach at the prestigious program as well. So we were off to a, a really quick and, and successful start and then towards um i guess the aau season is when we hit a little bit of a lull and i think the biggest challenge we've hit is because we don't have teams in our program right now it's just pretty much just clinics and um training so we kind of lost a few kids from training and clinics just because they were on separate teams right um we'll have teams in the fall which will be great but for now a challenge that we had we faced is uh getting big numbers for just clinics each week uh, just because kids, I guess, are have, they have their practices. And if their team's running a clinic within their own you know, program, then they kind of want to do that. Uh, and we're kind of our own separate entity right now. So sounds, um, it sounds very familiar to us. Yeah, it sounds very Does familiar. It? <laughs> it's, it sounds it sounds super familiar because I've been we've we focus mostly on camps and clinics right. and training and that kind of stuff. And I've never I've never done teams. Mm-hmm. Uh, I had a, uh, what, a business do a partner. Re- do you have a reason for that? You know what? I never really, to be honest, I, I'm not, I don't enjoy the, I don't enjoy dealing with the 
this is going to sound like the wrong word, but the <laughs> politic, the politics of of putting together teams yep. and balancing and making sure that everybody's getting playing time and people have paid their six hundred dollars and so yeah you know you got to make sure that everybody plays yeah. and i'm all for that I'm, I'm all for playing time being equal and trying to divide it out but then you get into some people that have different motivations and some parents yeah. want to win and so uh, you're arguing you know you're having to have conversations with those people and so that was something that what i love about coaching is the teaching piece of it yeah. that's the part of it that i really really like and so i'm happy to coach a team where I can control all those factors that we just talked about. I'm happy to run a camp or a training right, where yeah. I can do those things. And the idea of kind of overseeing an entire organization of teams then opens up some of those problems where you have, again, let's say I have 20 teams. Well, now I have 200 kids and their families that may have competing ways of looking at things. And that's right. never been super attractive to me. And yet at the same time, I can see where that's also an opportunity where if I did do that, I might be able to have an impact on those people in a positive way and attract people who would want to be of the same philosophy and mindset like what you're describing. So that's kind of why I've stayed out of it. But at some point, again, I think the the landscape continues to shift and move and there's different ways of looking at it. But for me, for me personally, what I enjoy more than anything else is the the camps and the training yeah. piece of it, as opposed to as opposed to being the overseer of an organization of teams. Yeah, I'm I'm loving like like you said, I'm loving the fact that we're just doing clinics right now, and it's it's our thing, so there's no politics involved, and uh, we run you know our our, our clinics are are. Um, they're high energy. They're they're energetic. They're motivating. We do station work. The kids are working hard. It's a great atmosphere in the gym. Um, and the same thing when we do like mini camps. It's 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 all great. And I'm worried that maybe with teams it may get watered down a little bit, like you said, due to the politics and all and you know and all those things. Uh, but where we're trying to differentiate, and people have laughed at me when I told them this, um, is within the program we're going to try to keep away and keep out as many politics and, and keep the parents away as much as possible where we're going to let them know that, Hey, this is, this is the atmosphere. This is how the program's going to be run. It's going to be ran just like a, a, a structured cultural, um, a high culture, you know, high school program. There's going to be, there's going to be no complaining about playing time there. The, the kids will play when, how as much, you know, how the coaches feel they should play and what gives them the best opportunity to win. Will everyone play? I'm sure at some point they will, but I need, um, for you guys as the parents to, to, to trust and stay away as much as possible, and we want to keep the politics out. So I told another AAU guy this, and he said, good luck. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll tell you what. The first thing that you're doing right is if you communicate that with parents up front, yep. I think that's a huge piece of it. And I know that just from talking to different people over many years – and just kind of having an understanding and learning about the landscape. I think one of the things that you end up doing is if you have that communication up front and you make sure that the people who you are bringing into your organization as families, that they understand what they're getting into and you stick by and make sure that your culture is a strong one, mm -hmm. then you may occasionally get somebody who sneaks through the cracks, who doesn't yep. fit into your culture. Mm -hmm. But for the most part, if you express the things that you express to us tonight to some people, some people are going to look at that and they're going to go, I'm not interested in that. I'd rather right. go over here where they, they don't care me. about having yeah. fun. They don't care about life lessons. They just want to win. Yep. And, and they some don't, yeah. people, some people may go that route. And those are the people you don't want in your organization. Exactly. And so that's what you got to do. Yeah. I think that's just because, and we're, I'm blessed. And, uh, the, the female, uh, partner that I have works on the other, the girl's, basketball program at the same school we are we're both blessed that our, our programs are both programs that have um a really good culture there's no bs there's no um headaches on either team and um i think we were we're so blessed that we have that in our high school programs and we're really going to try our hardest to bring that into our youth programs but um you know we're definitely blessed because the more stories you hear about other programs and 
around you have kids doing this and, and coaches doing that. We're, we're going to try as best we can, as I said, to, to carry on those the, the culture that we've we've built from our, within our high school programs to this empire program. Um, and hopefully it it, um, you know, it'll keep out the people that you don't want and bring in as many good people and, and good kids as, as we can. And hopefully it'll it'll um, you know, it'll expand and, and we'll we'll do what we got to do. Yeah, I think if you know who you are, I think that attracts mm -hmm. people who believe in the same things that you believe. And like I said, it doesn't work 100%, but I do believe that if you are clearly communicating what it is that you believe and the way that you run your program and you're putting that out there for people to see, I think what's going to happen is you're going to find that those type of people are going to be the ones that eventually find you. And then that's going to, is, is going to what, is going to be allowing you to have success with your with your teams as you move forward with that piece of your business. Yeah, and I think it's important that we just got to make sure, um, as you know, you got to hire the right staff and this and the people that that share your values and share right. the same mission and can help build the culture and not veer off on their own thing. I think that's one of the scarier things as well when you expand um, and you have you know so and so amount of teams. You need to make sure that each coach. You know, even if, you know, if myself or my other partners are not in the building, they're still carrying out with what we're putting out, our, our, our same product, um, which you have to make sure is happening. Yeah, there's no question. I think if I look at, if somebody were to ask me what is the biggest challenge and what's been my thing that has, I don't know, held me back is the wrong word, but I've kind of kept my thing sort of self-contained where almost everything we do, I've been there. And in order to expand beyond that. And I'm not even sure that I necessarily even want to, and I've been doing it for 27 years, so I'm not right. sure how motivated I am to, <laughs> to grow it beyond what it's, what it, what it's been and what it is. But, you know, it's difficult, I think, to find those people that share the same mentality that you do. And just, it's hard to find people who care about it as much as you do. And you've got to definitely go through a process and those people are out there. There's no yeah. doubt. Oh, yeah. And I've had some of them work for me, but it's difficult sometimes to find people, especially when you're talking about if you're going to coach, let's say, an AAU team in the spring. Well, that's a part time job that's not going to pay a whole lot. Right. And so it's difficult to find people who have the time and the passion uh, to be able to dedicate and do the things that you would do as somebody who's the, you know, the director of an organization. Mm -hmm. And so you're right, 100 percent that it's a challenge to find good people. But when you do, now you've really got something yep. because oh, then, yeah. like you said, when you're not in the gym, then that culture continues. And that's really when you have something as an organization yeah, that's that, something special. Yeah, that's when you can really expand. And um, early on here, we've, we've got some good people um, that are with us and uh, we're trying to groom some other people as well. It's just uh, when something's your baby, you got to make sure that it's For sure. <laughs> It's in yep. good hands, as you know. So Absolutely. There's no question about that. So let me ask you, do you guys use your high school gym as your kind of home base, or how do you yeah. how yeah. do you secure your facilities? Yeah, right now we're using our, our Luhai as the, as the home gym. Um, Got it. Got it. We are, and then do, you take, do you take some stuff on the road to other places, or is almost everything exclusively there? Right now we're using Luhai as the home gym. As I said, okay. we're using the uh, – we're using there's two gyms. Then there's a main gym that another outside program uses. So we, okay. we don't we don't really go in there. And then there's a back gym that we kind of we're trying to make our home. Got it for for this upcoming fall with teams and all that. So if we can make that back gym our home for about five days of the week, we're in a good spot. And then uh, what we've been doing is we're like I told you we're going we we've been running free clinics at different gyms and trying to build different relationships just in case we need another gym. Right. Um, to do that as well. So. Uh, we got friends in Brooklyn, which is a little bit of a hike from here, but uh, we got friends over there, friends in uh, Port Washington, it's called, which is about 25 minutes away. So we're building relationships just in case um, some, th some things don't work out. But uh, right now, Luhai is, is, is our home spot, which is a really, it, it, we're, we're, we're blessed because it's a beautiful gym. Even the back gym, it's really nice. Yeah, having good facilities is key and being able uh, to get access to them. There's it's it's one of the most challenging things, at least here in the Cleveland area, is being able to find space to be able to do the things that you want to do. And then at least here, too, I think one of the things that we run into is just the number of people that are doing similar things. Yeah, everyone's doing what, what you're doing. doing. 
right? Yep. <laughs> and so you got to figure out, like you said, what are what are our differentiators? And so the yep. things that you described earlier can be your differentiators. And it's tough because when every single person hangs out a shingle and mm-hmm. says, I'm this basketball trainer, I'm running these camps, or I'm doing this training, or I've got this AAU program, it becomes very, very difficult. It almost becomes where basketball is a commodity. Yeah. Yeah, where exactly. it's, it's not something that it's not something that I do, and I go and work with Empire Youth Athletics because I think they're better than somebody else. It's just because, well, their gym is close to me, and they do it on Tuesday nights, and that's when right. I'm free. Right. And that's what you want to avoid. You want to make your program a destination where people see through the clutter of what's out there, and they say, the reason why I'm going with Empire is because these guys do it right, and yeah. I want my kid to be associated with them. And that really, to me. When you reach that point, that's when you know that you're on your way to having tremendous success when people are seeking you out. But it's tough to do. Yeah, it is. It, it is tough to do. I think what's helping us out right now, what helped us um, get off the ground, is that we have two Lou High uh, staff members that have both won at the high school level at a really high level, and me and um, Christine is my other partner. And then um, once they get into the gym and they see how I think passionate, how energetic we are. Our, our atmosphere, our product is great. If you've come, if they, if you've been to a clinic and the parents have told us, this is stuff that we've been looking for in Long Island for a long time. We're bringing a lot of energy. We know what we're talking about. We're good people. We're not putting down any of the kids. We're we're promoting teams. Uh, you know, uh, promoting teamwork. We're promoting little things like high fives and not just you know scoring. We're promoting helping your teammate off the ground. It's it's all things that I think parents are starting to realize are a lot bigger than just scoring if you want to make a team and uh i think the two things that i said there the luhi name behind us and then our product that we've been giving out um have really put us in a, in a good spot right now yeah and those are two things that again differentiate you from your competition yep exactly and when you have parents that become educated over time about what you do and why you do what you do and how it can impact their kid that's going to ultimately be the program selling point they're going to come and they're going to find you because they've heard from other parents that hey this has transformed my kid not just Mm -hmm. as a basketball player as a person it's begun to transform them as a person and there's nothing there's nothing better than that i want to ask you kind of get to wrap up here by asking you a question related to the future of empire youth athletics and ask you to look a little bit into the future let's say two or three years down the road if you could wave your magic wand and kind of get things to be exactly where you'd want them to be two or three years down the road, what would Empire Youth Athletics look like in your mind? And after you answer that, then we'll circle back to let you share out your contact information and wrap things up. Beautiful. Um, so two or three down, two or three years down the line, I think uh, we have multiple AAU teams. Um, I think we're we're up and running with numerous clinics during the week and. Uh, mini camps in the summer and running our own summer camp and really trying to take over the tri-state area. Um, And then also, we're also leaning towards starting lacrosse and soccer, which we've got going too. So we're going to try to take over um, all sports within Long Island and then hopefully our basketball, which we've been doing, you know, which is our leading horse right now, we'll take over the tri-state area and we'll have multiple teams competing at a high level. Um, It'll be It'll be uh, a program that a lot of parents that want to be a part of because we're teaching, you know, things that we, you know, go way beyond X and O stuff. And we're trying to, like you said before, not only building them as players, but as people. Uh, and that's through all our sports. And um, I really see us down the line um, being, you know, a force to be reckoned with uh, in the tri-state area. Very cool. Love it. I love the idea of having multiple sports underneath your umbrella yep. to allow kids to be able to participate in different sports, yet being under the same coaching philosophy, the same ideas, exactly. the same culture. Yep. That to me our, is something that if I was a parent, that would be very attractive to me. We had our first lacrosse clinic this past weekend, and it was it was two of our guys that we know really well, and they promoted the same type of values we did. It was a high-energy clinic. It was about 20 kids. They broke down the skills perfectly. They brought great energy. Uh, the parents couldn't have been happier. So I'm happy that we got that started. And if we can do that um, consistently for basketball across and then soccer is getting going this week, 
uh, the sky's the limit for Empire for sure. If we can get all all you know all sports going at the same level, that's awesome. All right, before we get out, Derek, I want to give you a chance share your contact information with people so they can reach out to you after they listen to the show. Give out your social media, whatever you want to share for people to get in touch with you. Go ahead and do that. And then if there's anything else that we didn't hit on tonight that you want to share before we wrap things up, you can go ahead and do that as well. Beautiful. I'm going to share uh, our Twitter first. It's at Empire, E-M-P-I-R-E, Youth, Y-O-U-T-H, A-T-H-L. So it's Empire Youth F F L. <laughs> we couldn't fit in the, uh, the I athletic. got it, right? So I that, know, that's I know our, that is. That's our that's our Twitter, and I'm gonna lay my Twitter out there too, because I'm always, you know, trying to get my followers up. <laughs> yep. Uh, mine's at Coach Derek Klein. Uh, so at Coach D E R E K, capital K L E I N, and then I'm gonna get our Twitter on there. Uh, sorry, our Instagram on there. Um, I'm just looking it up now. Uh, our Instagram is Empire Youth Athletics, just one word. So E M P I R E Youth Athletics, um, just one word, all all lowercase. Give us a follow for sure. We're we're putting up all our con- uh, content, basketball clinics. We got a mini camp coming up, jul- starting in July, first week of July, and uh, going to the end of summer. Then hopefully in the fall, everyone can follow along as we get our teams going and uh, you know try to take over the area over here. And um, that's really it. I appreciate you guys having me on, man. This has been fun. I, I can talk all night with you guys. Exactly. It's been a blast. We'll put all those social media contacts. We'll put those in the show notes so people can find them on the uh, Hoop Heads pod. Um, yeah, I just got <clears> your <throat> follow now, man. Yep, yep. on the web page. Uh, we'll get it all on there so when people listen to the show, they'll be able to go circle back to the notes and find all that information out from you. Uh, Derek, like you said, this has been a pleasure. It's been a blast talking hoops with you. Uh, we can't thank you enough for spending almost an hour and a half of your time with us I tonight. Can- I can keep going, man. Let's go to let's hit midnight. <laughs> <laughs> it's been it's been great, and you know, again, we've told uh, you know we've told a lot of our guests open invitation to come back as things go. You know, you keep growing what you're doing. I think it's you're off to a great start. I love your philosophy, and I think you're going to have tremendous success based on just the way you're going about your business. And we wish you the best of luck. We can't thank you enough for spending that time with us. And to everyone out there, we will catch you on our next episode. Thanks. I appreciate you, Mike. J- Head Start Basketball's Player Development Academy offers Cleveland area players a unique opportunity to improve their basketball skills. Regardless of a player's age, skill level, or position, training with Head Start Basketball will elevate your game to the next level. Do you want to improve your ball handling, become a better shooter, or develop into a more skilled, confident player? Our academy classes offer training that's designed to do just that. Our training sessions are innovative and will have you learning skills that are transferable to actual games. We have four different class skill levels for boys and girls ages four and up. All Player Development Academy classes will be held at the Strongsville Recreation Center. For more information or to get registered, please visit www.headstartbasketball.com. Thanks for listening to the Hoop Heads Podcast presented by Head Start Basketball.